Hi, everyone. This is Jason Bureko of Wall Street from Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street from Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a first-time guest, but I've been following his work for years. Actually, I think he does great work. I learned so much from him. He's a certified financial planner. He's founder and president of the PFS Group of Companies, and he's been the host of the Financial Sense News Hour since 1987. Jim Poplava, thank you for joining me. Oh, great to be with you. Now, Jim, I want to ask you about the strong rebound in gold and gold stocks since December. Uh, why do you think that this has happened? I think there were a couple of events that happened. They all happened in the month of February. Japan uh, went to negative interest rates, and then when Janet uh, Yellen was on Capitol Hill, she basically was reversing what the Fed was saying in December, where they said you know, they were going to be raising interest rates a quarter point every quarter, in strong economic growth. Well, if you listen to what she was saying in February, it was a complete reversal. So I think that and the combination of negative interest rates has finally given the impetus to gold, uh, and uh, we saw a very explosive rally. And one of the reasons I think you've seen gold stocks and uh, not only the metals do well, but the stocks in particular, is it was such a beaten down sector over the last three, three and a half years and the sector is so small, Jason, if you, you take a look at the market cap of all the large gold stocks, it doesn't even equal Coca-Cola. So when money starts moving into the sector, whether it's going into ETFs like GLD, SLD, or it's going into GDX or even the mutual funds, that's why you get this, you know, some of these gold stocks are up 100 and 200 percent this year. Yeah, it's like a small hole in a dam, how the water just keeps going faster and faster and faster. You brought up the point about negative interest rates. We have, I think, over $12 trillion in global negative interest rates. Do you think, then, that that's really good for gold? Absolutely, because, I mean, uh, what are your choices? I mean, the world is awash in liquidity, and especially after Brexit. And where are you going to put that money? Uh, well, you can put it in, uh, what is it, uh, $13 trillion of negative interest rates that are uh, sovereign debt, and it's actually, <laughs> excuse me, much worse than that when you take a look at shorter-term securities, like a three-year Swiss government bond is a negative 1.1%. And so this makes owning gold, and, and you really saw this in February when the Japanese central bank tried negative interest rates. And it was amazing because there was a run on safes in the country. And if you couldn't get a safe to keep your money under a mattress or in a safe, you know, the Japanese investors started buying gold. And so the the negative interest rate environment has sort of backfired, and I think it's very gold uh, positive. And I think that we're going to see negative rates and lower rates for a lot longer than most people think. Yeah, the demand for physical gold during the paper bear market in U.S. dollar terms, there was a lot of physical demand out of India and Russia and China. Their governments and their people were buying gold. But the Western investor seems to have gotten back in now that the gold chart is pretty good. And like you said, there it's not a huge market, so a lot of money is moving in. Now, I want to ask you about your opinion of the state of the global economy. Uh, do you think the global economy is slowing down a lot in the last 12 months? I think it's in a process of slowing down. You, you get these periodic episodes where you get a little bump like we're seeing in the U.S. Uh, when uh, interest rates come down because I think that is postponed. I think eventually, Jason, in our opinion, we're going to see a recession in the U.S. I thought it might have been in maybe the first half of 2017. But now with interest rates at record levels, I mean, we did a show on record interest rates uh, a month ago. And yet last week, for the first time in U.S. history, the Treasury issued a 30-year bond at a rate of 2.17. Germany issued a bond at a negative five basis point. So that's postponed it somewhat. But you're definitely seeing a slowdown. I don't care if you're looking at China, if you're looking at Asia, if you're looking at here in the U.S., where even the Fed has had to revise its forecast. And I just uh, – uh, I think it was the IMF today that just came out and they lowered their global forecast – for the global economy. So we're in a definite slowdown. Um, without stimulus, um, basically, the economy is on life support. Uh, do you think negative interest rates are basically the end game for Keynesian economics? Do you think the these central bankers are running out of policy options, monetary and fiscal policy options to try to stimulate the economy? Or are they going to try crazy stuff like Ben Bernanke outlined in his 2002 helicopter speech? I think they got plenty of options left. Uh, believe it or not, uh, 
I don't think this is the end game. I think uh, what we're moving uh, towards, and we're following this very closely, is helicopter money. Now, I am going to be analyzing, uh, I'm doing it right now, I'm analyzing the Republican platform, and I'm going to be analyzing the Democratic platform. And if you look at both platforms, you don't hear either candidate, whether it's Donald Trump or it's Hillary Clinton, you don't hear either one of them talking about a balanced budget or the deficit. You know, that's gone out the window, and that went out the window last November with the uh, Republican Congress making a deal with the White House and getting rid of the sequester. So this year the budget deficit uh, is going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 550 to $600 billion. And I think what you're going to see coming from both parties, no matter who wins the White House, is some form of stimulus or fiscal spending because central banks have all but said, hey, look, we've done everything we can. It would be much more effective if you have some form of, uh, some form of fiscal policy. So in the U.K., they just ab- uh, abandoned their balanced budget. The U.S. abandoned its balanced budget. You've got in uh, Europe, you've got France, Spain, and Italy uh, pushing on Brussels saying, you know, this austerity thing isn't working. You've got Japan talking about helicopter drops. You've got China talking about maybe more fiscal spending in the way of uh, infrastructure. Who knows? They'll build another uh, empty city. But all governments now are realizing that if you want to get money in the economy, one of the direct ways to do it is a helicopter drop. The problem we have, Jason, is credit growth in this economic recovery has been very anemic. So even though banks are sitting on a lot of money with regulations and and you're not seeing enough demand, there just isn't a lot of credit moving through the system. So governments have been frustrated, central banks have been frustrated because normal monetary policy isn't working or is becoming less effective. So the next way to get money into the economy is actually drop a helicopter, whether it's going to be tax cuts, it's going to be an uh, the earned income credit, uh, whether it's going to be, uh, uh, let's say, spending on infrastructure, some form or another, that's what's coming next. And it's not just going to be here. I think it's going to be global. And central banks will just simply print the money. Yeah, a lot of this monetary inflation over the years, it's gone into asset prices. It hasn't gone nearly as much into the real economy like you talked about the credit growth. We're not seeing the velocity of money. The velocity of money for a long time now since 2008 has been declining in the real economy on Main Street. Well, I mean, it, it, not only has it been declining, but if you look at since 2009, what has the individual investor done? They've kept their money in cash or gone into bond funds. Uh, even on the institutional side now, money market uh, cash reserves are up to around 5.7% as of last month. So we got high cash balances. People don't know what the heck to do. And part of the reason is you know, when you're analyzing how to invest, when you're analyzing where to put your money, so much depends on what central bankers are going to do. I mean, a lot of hedge funds have lost a lot of money this year shorting the bond market. Uh, and especially leading up to Brexit, and then look what happens after Brexit. We get bond yields, and when you think they can't go lower, they do. So uh, I, I just think that uh, what we're going to see going forward is a concerted effort to try to re-stimulate the economy, and I think we're going to go from a disinflationary environment more towards an inflationary environment because – it's like Bernanke's speech. You know, they, they have a printing press. And in a fiat money system, if you want to create inflation, believe me, central banks have the power and governments have the power to do it. And a good example is what's going on in Venezuela right now where you have annualized inflation rates of 1,600%. Yeah, that's a great point about Venezuela. Although the U.S. is the world reserve currency, and I don't think the world reserve currency has ever hyperinflated. We do have Larry Summers, though, talking about – potential large infrastructure projects that would make the New Deal look tiny. Do you think that the candidates are going to be either Clinton or Trump are going to be promising these types of New Deal make work projects uh, to build, rebuild the U.S.'s infrastructure? Oh, absolutely. Well, number one, if you look at the society engineers, America's infrastructure, I think, has got a D minus uh, in terms of its uh, safety. I mean, we've got bridges that are breaking down. Uh, roads that are in disrepair, disrepair, water systems that need to be done. So there's a strong case to be made. But the problem is there was a, an article in the Wall Street Journal 
on uh, Monday talking about home building and home starts are down. And one of the reasons, Jason, is the building permit process of getting through environmental permits. Uh, it, it takes so long. And if you're a home builder and it's going to take you a year, year and a half to go through the permitting environmental process, you don't know what the economy is going to be a year from and a half from now, so you're not taking the chance. And the problem with these infrastructure projects is by the time you go through regional environmental controls uh, and all the bureaucratic maze just to get anything done, it could take years to get anything effectively done. Yeah, you, you live in California, and I used to live in California for 15 or 16 years. And, yeah, the construction industry there is very difficult, takes, uh, takes many years longer, costs a lot longer to get projects done that in other states would take uh, half the time and cost half as much money. I also remember during the 2008 election when Obama got elected the first time, he was promising all these shovel-ready projects. I don't think any, uh, even half of the projects he was promising ever came to fruition. They took so long, and they didn't create the jobs he said they would. No, and, and, and it's because you're going through a bureaucratic maze. In fact, uh, this article about housing starts, they talked about, like in my own state, I built a home. It took me two and a half years to build it, and it was one year just going through the permitting. We had to go through the regional environmental authority. Then you had the fire department, uh, which was disagreeing with the city department. And you're you're dealing with a maze of bureaucratic laws that just – cause anything to be done on a timely basis almost next to impossible so you got to have shovel ready projects and i doubt very seriously that the government has that and so even though they may talk about infrastructure it may be a couple years before you get anything done yeah well that that's the government clock right there well i want to ask you about the oil market i consider you one of the best researchers of the oil market you've uh, read so many books on peak oil and oil in the energy markets about peak cheap oil. What has the U.S. shale oil boom done to the oil market and peak oil, in your opinion? I think, in my opinion, it's postponed it. Uh, and I think it's not just the U.S. market. That same technology, Jason, can be applied elsewhere in the world. So I think it's delayed it, and it also changed the dynamics of OPEC's power. Because at one time, OPEC ruled the oil market. So, you know, basically, all they'd have to do is say, we're going to cut production. Prices would spike. Uh, and likewise, we're going to increase production and prices would come down. Well, now they have the U.S. to contend. I mean, when you think that U.S. oil production went from over 5 million barrels to 9.6 million barrels, we're the single largest contributing factor to the oil markets in the last decade. So it's been a changing dynamic, and it's one of the reasons OPEC has had such difficulty, including Saudi Arabia, saying, you know, what good does us – it do us to cut production by a million barrels. They'll just be a million barrels we'll lose in market share to somebody else like American producers or other players that are out in the market. So the dynamics of the oil market are changing and technology keeps driving down the cost of whether it's shale or even deep water drilling. So uh, the dynamics of the market, uh, OPEC is no longer in the driver's seat. I mean, if they were to operate in a concerted effort, and basically saying we're going to cut 3 million barrels of oil production a day. They, they could turn the market around, but they're not going to be able to do that. Most OPEC countries get the majority of their revenue to support government come from oil revenues. So everybody's cheating. Nobody is in line, and the only people that really could effectively do anything would be the Russians in, the, in, the, uh, in Saudi Arabia, and they're not about to do that. So the dynamics, but however – Market forces are eventually going to exert themselves because, number one, we're losing three, three and a half million barrels a day due to depletion. So, you know, that has to be replaced. Secondly, what we've seen going back a couple months ago is how fragile this market is when you had those fires in the Canadian oil sands, which took a little over a million barrels offline. You've got Nigerian oil production that's down about eight or 900,000 barrels due to uh, terrorist attacks on their infrastructure. So you've got several million barrels of oil that have been kept offline for either geological reasons or geopolitical reasons. So it's a very fragile market, but eventually, like anything else in the Western world, uh, supply and demand will eventually catch up. If you take the major oil companies, the integrated companies from Exxon to Chevron to Royal Dutch, 
Jason, they're only replacing about 70% of their reserves. In fact, you take a large company like Royal Dutch, they're going through uh, and emphasizing shareholder value rather than growing reserves. And so eventually that is going to catch up in the markets. You you, you can't reduce the, the amount of oil rigs out there by two-thirds, and eventually that's not going to show up. One thing I think that postponed uh, the um, – uh, correction in the oil market uh, for a longer period of time is that a lot of these shale drillers had to keep drilling existing wells because they had to service their debt payments. And so the real key is what is a marginal cost of a barrel of oil? And that's probably closer to $20 in many cases for some of these drillers. So a lot of this production still remained online and it took a lot longer to reduce the rig count in production, but you know, taking a look at where we see oil at the end of the year, we think oil production in the U.S. could be down by a million barrels a day. The EIA is even getting a little bit more pessimistic. They think we could be down by 1.1 million barrels a day. You add to that growing demand, and eventually this market is going to be in balance. So I think the new figure uh, in the oil markets are going to be trading between, uh, let's say, the 40s in 50s and maybe occasionally spiking to, to 60. And uh, the only reason I don't think it's not going to get above that for a while is during the oil glut period, there was a lot of oil that was put into storage facilities, whether on tanker or in uh, uh, terminal storage. Jim, there was also a lot of wells that were drilled and just capped and not producing yet. But yeah, the, the Saudis and the Russians, they didn't actually cut production. They actually kept production at high levels. They were hoping that they would be able to bankrupt the shale producers uh, before oil prices dropped to $29 a barrel, but that didn't happen for a bunch of different reasons. Uh, I think the Saudis have actually gained some market share, but it hasn't been from the American drillers really that much. It's been from a lot of deep water uh, producers cutting back production and other high cost producers. So their, their strategy hasn't worked quite as much. I mean, they look at how much debt the oil producing countries have had to go in. I, I think you could also make an argument, you mentioned Venezuela earlier in the interview. I think Venezuela has probably collapsed a lot of reasons, not only because of socialism and a corrupt government, but also because of low oil prices. Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, when Chavez took over the country, he got rid of a lot of Pavezda workers, and uh, oil production went into decline. Now, he was fortunate when he came into power that we were going through those oil spark, uh, spikes in the last decade. So even though production declined, prices tripled. So, you know, that kept the state alive. But production has steadily declined. And, and the same like states like Mexico that did not invest a lot of their oil revenues back into future exploration. It's one of the reasons why Mexico is kind of like bidding out for oil leases to Western companies because they haven't uh, put the money into infrastructure. And the same thing with Venezuela. So, you know, if you take a look at most OPEC countries, there's very few OPEC countries that are actually increasing production. Now, now, Jim, I want to I want to transition topics, and uh, I want to ask you about the European banking crisis. I think everyone knows about the problems with Deutsche Bank, but we're hearing problems with Italian banks. Uh, Banco Santander seems to have popped out of nowhere. Uh, why do you think the European banks are getting in so much of a crisis all of a sudden? I think uh, uh, number one is a weak economy. Number two, you have a lot of businesses that have made it. You've got high unemployment. And any kind of um, society where you have government directing bankers to do things and make loans in certain ways, the, it's inefficient and uneconomical. And I think we're seeing the results of that today with all of these loans in default. You've got, what, about 17% of Italian bank loans are in default right now. It's the same thing, Jason, that um, – we saw in the U.S. in the housing crisis with various legislation that encouraged banks to make loans to people that really couldn't afford to make the payments. And so the same thing is happening to Europe. It's just a little bit more delayed. It happened here first. Yeah, that's a great point. And I don't think the European banks, there wasn't an attempt to capitalize them like uh, the Federal Reserve and uh, the U.S. government tried to do with recapitalizing American banks. Not that American banks are that much better, but there was just you know very little or no effort at all to recapitalize European banks. Yeah, and I think in Europe, you're you're you know we're still more of a private sector economy in the United States, despite increasing regulation and taxation in this country, which is making 
you know, business formation, probably the worst it's ever been in any kind of economic recovery. But when you compare that to Europe, you know, we still look a lot better. We capitalized our banks a lot faster, and we still have, despite the efforts of government with regulation and taxation, we are still more of a private sector economy than what you see in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, I want to ask you about the Chinese banking sector. Do you think China's China's going to have to bail out the uh, the 19 trillion in bad loans from their state-owned banks and municipalities then? I think eventually they're going to have to do it. They have no choice and unlike uh, Europe or even here, most of the banks in China are run by the government. So, they're basically they're bailing out themselves. <laughs> oh, man, this is this is just total malinvestment on, you know, larger and larger scales from so many governments and they just try more and more central planning. And, you know, it, it just seems like the policy decisions are, oh, we didn't go large enough, so we're going to have to go even larger next time. Well, I mean, you, you even see it here in U.S. politics. Uh, I don't care if you're looking at Bernie Sanders or even both parties. It's like, well, it hasn't worked over there, but, you know, trust us, we know better. And, uh, you know, they keep trying the same thing. And uh, a good example is the um, – Recent in my own state, we raised the minimum wage to $15. And, and what, what are you seeing? You are seeing restaurant owners that are going to automation and kiosks. So they're just going to put more people out of work, and you're going to have higher unemployment. And it's uh, what I call unintended consequences. A lot of these people don't think through, uh, you know, and this is just my personal opinion, but I don't think there are a lot of people that are, you know, getting out of high school and going to college that aspire to be, uh, you know, cooking French fries at a McDonald's. These are starter jobs. But the more and more we do and mess with the economy, as central bankers, government, and politicians do, the worse off it becomes. Amen. I, I completely agree. And unfortunately, I think it's going to get worse in terms of the intervention into an economy. Uh, the people in power, you know, they're tinkerers. They just like messing with things. You know, they want to keep their job. There are cushy jobs, especially, you know, these politicians in Brussels with the Brexit. These guys are going to be fighting uh, the Brexit for years to come. Uh, same thing with the guys who are, uh, don't want to be replaced in England. Well, it's not like that. And you even see it here. I mean, it, it's like we keep doing the same thing. And, uh, you know, it's nobody pays much attention. But two weeks ago, the trustees of Social Security just issued their annual report. The unfunded liabilities of Social Security went up $6 trillion in the last year alone. And yet you've got politicians out there that are saying, you know what, we're going to make Social Security benefits more generous. We're going to make Medicare benefits more generous. We're going to give you free college. Uh, you know, this is an election year, and that's what politicians do. They have no consequence or understanding of their own actions and what it causes in terms of the economy. They know that Social Security is heading for trouble, and uh, it's amazing. Last uh, November, they made a major change to Social Security that basically put women at a disadvantage in Social Security recipients. It was the biggest change to Social Security. It was swept under the cover, uh, uh, carpet. Nobody paid attention to it. But the reason they did it, Jason, is uh, basically the disability trust fund was going to be broke at the end of this year. So they had to put a stopgap measure to get them through the election. So they swept these changes underneath the carpet to keep the thing afloat for another year. And here we have an election year where they're promising voters that they're going to make their benefits uh, even more generous. Yeah, exactly. There's there's no such thing as a free lunch. So they can make all these promises, but then the taxpayer, the U.S. taxpayer and the U.S. saver, the middle class person who's tried to do the right thing and then needs income to retire on, they're the ones who are going to end up being screwed. Well, you know, they're being screwed right now. I mean, you know, the unintended consequences of central bank actions is, yes, you and I, Jason, can go out. If I want to get a 30-year mortgage today, I can get a 15-year mortgage under 3%. I can get a uh, you know, a 30-year mortgage in the low 3% range. So it's great if you're a debtor. And the biggest debtor of all is the U.S. government. So if you take a look at the government's interest costs, last year for the government's 2015 fiscal year, total interest expense for the U.S. government was $430 billion. Now, what makes that interesting is eight years ago, the government had $9 trillion less in debt, and it paid $450 billion. And interest costs. So add nine trillion more debt, and the government is spending twenty 
billion less in interest costs. Now, the, re, the adverse effects of that is if you're a saver, money is becoming meaningless or becoming nothing. And the best example I can illustrate is, uh, if Jason, if you had $100,000 in your IRA account in the year 2000, I could have got you seven or $8,000 uh, in terms of income on that 100000 Fast forward 16 years later, on that same $100,000, I'd be lucky if I can get you $1,400. That just goes to show you what these policies have done to savers and investors. And it's one of the reasons why you're seeing the stock market hold up as well as it has. Yeah, we've had 10% corrections. But underneath uh, the stock market, there hasn't been corporate earnings. This will be the fifth consecutive quarter that corporate earnings have declined. It's low interest rates. When you think they can't go lower, they push them lower. Yeah, financial repression seems to be a wealth transfer from the savers on Main Street to the Washington, D.C. government and also Wall Street. Uh, so judging by your comments in the, in the last question, you don't expect then a stock market crash in the next six to 12 months? You know, unless there's something outside of something, you know, a, a, some kind of major terrorist attack, a major financial bankruptcy, uh, I just don't see it outside those type of events. But here's, here's, here's where we run into risk. When the economy is growing, uh, it acts as a shock absorber. For the markets, as long as the economy is growing, yeah, you might have something like Brexit. You get a two-day correction. Uh, you could have a slowdown of negative GDP in a quarter, and the market corrects, and then it bounces back because there's just too much liquidity out there and low interest rates. However, when the economy continues to weaken, and if the Fed, which I think they're trying to normalize monetary policy and get interest rates up there, there's going to be one interest rate hike too far. And when we get into a recession, that's where the real risk of a stock market crash comes into play because now you have negative economic growth instead of positive economic growth. You no longer have that shock absorber. So unless there is something out there like I'm, whether it's a, a, an attack like 9-11 that is as horrific as 9-11 was or – some major financial firm goes belly up like long-term capital management did or uh, something like that. I, I just I, – I, I think you're going to see more corrective phases. There's just too much liquidity out there with no place to put money. Yeah, that's a good point on the liquidity. I don't, I don't know if you've heard this, but Jim Rickard says there's been over $30 trillion in liquidity printed since 2008 to bail out the derivatives markets and uh, prevent any future ba uh, banking collapses. Well, just take a look at Brexit. Uh, right afterwards, the Bank of England was going to make av available 250 billion pounds. So, you know, their, their standard answer is when there's any kind of event – they flood the markets with liquidity. It drives interest rates lower. And, and, you know, the stock market record that we're seeing right now, in my personal opinion, is being driven by lower interest rates. Uh, now, we, in, in terms of our whole discussion here, you're a money manager. Uh, what markets do you see value or do you think all this liquidity is making it uh, very, very difficult to find any value in any market right now? Uh, no, there's still value out there. You've got to do different things, and you, you, you've got to adapt to the market. I mean, we uh, last uh, in the fourth quarter of last year when we had bond market spreads widen tremendously, we went in and picked up some short-term corporate debt one and two years where we you know, picked up some nice yields. We're looking for similar opportunities and any kind of crisis that would emerge, uh, for example, right after Brexit. Uh, we're doing things like uh, cash arbitrage on takeovers, and then uh, you know we're finding value still in the energy space. We still like precious metals, and believe it or not, uh, we're looking for those high dividend-paying stocks. We've been in telecoms, and believe it or not, uh, who would have thought we'd be talking this way? But in the technology sector, some of the best dividend growth companies are some old technology leaders where you can get dividend yields in growth that is, you know, 40% higher or 50% higher than what you can get in a 30-year Treasury bond. It's amazing, uh, but you would have to go back, Jason, to the 50s and early 60s 
to find a period of time in this country where dividend yields on stocks were higher than what they were on bonds. Yeah, and you're, you buy individual companies, right? You're not buying large indices, right? Because I think the general indices like the Dow and the S&P 500, I think there's a lot of valuation metrics you can look at where they are pretty overvalued, but you can do extra due diligence and find individual companies that are still bargains. Yeah, we, we tend to lean more. Uh, we, we buy more individual stocks and bonds unless we're going to do a short-term trade. Like if we think something got really beat up, and we just think it's a trade, we may tend to go to an ETF. But generally, we stick with uh, individual stocks and bonds uh, because that's what this market is all about. You have to be very selective, and you have to be uh, – got to do a lot more work to get a return in this kind of market because a lot of the avenues that traditionally existed for money managers, for example, if stocks were in a bear market, well, you can go in the bond market, and you got decent yields. I can remember in 2000 – we uh, actually hit out in sovereign bonds in Europe uh, where we were getting 5%. Hard to believe I'd say that now, but back in the year 2000, I could get 5% on a German government bond. And uh, those avenues uh, just aren't available like they were, let's say, 10, 15 years ago. So you have to look in a lot more different areas, and you have to be uh, put in a lot more homework today to, to find decent returns. But they're out there. It just takes a little bit more work. Yeah, I completely agree. I have one final question before I let you go. I know you're extremely widely read just like me and you're a student of history. Uh, do you think there's a specific time in financial history where right now is similar to? Um, in many ways, yes. I, I think uh, this is very similar to the 1930s. Uh, you have, instead of the deflation that we had in the 30s, we sort of have disinflation, and that's only because Central banks are preventing that deflation from completely taking place. As you mentioned, records talked about $30 trillion that has been injected into this economy. You're, you're having an, a reversal of um, globalism, so you're seeing protectionism rise. I don't care if it's Donald Trump or Bernie Sanders. You're seeing it reflected in Brexit and much of Europe. You're also seeing the rise of maybe not uh, – Fascism under, um, let's say, the Nazis, but, you know, in many ways, fascist governments rising and look at uh, Islamic terrorism. So it's very similar to the 1930s, eerily, in many ways. Yeah, I think there are similarities there uh, in terms of a potential, you know, stock market crash or central banks coming up with crazy policy decisions like Herbert Hoover and FDR. God knows what the politicians in D.C. are going to come up with next. I also see, you know, reminiscences of the 1970s stagflation when I go back and look at it. The guy on Main Street right now, Jim, you live in California. They're being killed with taxes. So their, their purchasing power of their currency is not as much as it used to be 10 years ago, and the government statistics aren't, aren't reflecting this. And then also their tax bills are just being layered on. As a resident of California, you probably see you know the taxes just being layered on across the board in so many different instances in your day-to-day -day spending. Oh, they're, they're doing it in so many ways. If you're a utility user here, they have tiered pricing in utilities. So in other words, if you use more power, you pay a higher rate like a progressive income tax. Then there's a 25% surcharge to pay for other people's utilities. You're seeing it in your phone bills, your cable bills. Your, you know, I just took two and a half years to build a house. Not only the bureaucratic maze I had to go through, but also the fees at every single level. We put solar power to bring our utility costs down, the inspection, the fees, everywhere you go. And that stuff doesn't get added into the inflation rate. You know, if they increase the sales tax, they increase – the property tax, they increase your cable bill, they increase your utility bill, all these little fees that the government is looking for, even here in California, if you have a computer, you buy a laptop, you buy an electronic device, they have an environmental fee. I mean, every way, uh, they don't call it taxes anymore, they call it fees, but it's one and the same. Yeah, I, I lived in California for a long time. I, I do love the weather there. The food's nice. The women are beautiful. But I don't think I would go back unless the taxes just got drastically cut. <laughs> well, you know, it's it's amazing because uh, California has the largest pension plan. And in their assumptions, which in, uh, which alters their funding, they're assuming a 7 and 8% rate of return. Well, they just – CalPERS just reported their rate of return last year. And it was less than seven-tenths of a percent. 
and the head of CalPERS is talking about the only way we're going to meet our pension obligations is to raise taxes again. Welcome to dystopia, my friend. <laughs> or, uh, yeah, I know. It, the, the, the People's Republic of California. Yeah, California has been acting like a European country for a while now. I guess that's what happens when the state was doing so well economically for so long. They could get away with this for a while before, you know, the economy just goes completely put uh, kaput. Well, you know, they've been fortunate enough that even after the financial crisis, the rise of social media, I mean, California took in over $2 billion in tax revenues on capital gains just on social media stocks. So they've been fortunate enough that we – we still have a lot of creativity in the state, but you you take the state of California, which is in itself one of the largest countries in the world economically, we've got everything. We have natural resources. We have farming. We have oil. We have mining. We have tourism. We have manufacturing. We have biotech. We have entertainment. We have the military. It is one of the most diverse economies in the world, and now you have politicians that are completely putting it into ruin. Yeah, well, I think a lot of that, you can say that about so many different countries right now. We just have, you know, so much central planning going on. But I, I could speak to you for a long time, Jim. I really enjoy your work. You're extremely well read. Uh, how do our listeners find your work uh, they, for the Financial Sense News Hour? And uh, tell our listeners about uh, the, the services you offer for the Poplava Financial Group of Companies. Okay, well, the easiest way to find us on the web is Financial Sense. That's spelled S E N S C. That's all one word, financialsense.com. You can. Listen to our premium channel, our, our weekend uh, market, in a, a new series that we started on retirement planning and money. And uh, the services uh, we manage, uh, we are fee-based investment advisors and financial. We provide wealth-based management, and they can reach us at uh, financialsense.com. Okay, great. Well, thank you for your time, and uh, hopefully I can interview you again in the future. All right. Thanks so much for having me on your program.